Hallelujah. Anybody know him for yourself in here? Come on, make some noise if you know him for yourself. Amen. Amen. As we get ready to go to God in prayer, I do want to remind you, I was looking for the right language, but on Thursday day, beginning at 9 a.m. in this um, in, in this building, we're going to have Transforming Justice Conference. We're going to have area leaders in a conversation about our justice system. We're going to have conversations with the new commissioner, um, Larry Krasner, our mayor. We have the city council president, uh, also the speaker. Uh, from the state level, Joanna McClinton. There are a number of other voices that will be here for a conversation all day long. And so we encourage you to go to Uplift Solutions to register for it. You can show up, but there's also food available and we'd like to know that you are coming. If you know you're coming just in the afternoon, not gonna have any food, you can just show up. Um, if you wanna eat, you wanna go to Uplift Solution, let us know you're coming. But it's a day of having a conversation about what do we in the African-American community in Philadelphia need to do to address the justice issues holistically. There's, there's, the, there's the stuff that is short-term and ugly, and there's the stuff that's mid-term and long-term and fun. But it takes all of it to address what is happening. As we pray for our Islamic Muslim brothers and sisters and the challenges that happen after uh, their uh, banquet. But we recognize that that's not an Islamic thing, that is a Philly thing. And we're not, when we cover them in prayer because we don't want anybody to project onto them something that is a Philadelphia issue. It is not simply a Muslim issue. And we pray for and with them. And so we're coming together to have those conversations because even though we're in the Northwest, Philadelphia is Philadelphia. And the answer to Philadelphia is in all of us doing our part. So I thank you for understanding that. And I'm really just saying, why don't you just hang out here Thursday all day long and then come to the AG piece on Thursday night. God, I bless you and thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the opportunity to serve. I thank you for the songwriter that reminds us that we can know you for ourselves. Thank you for the prophetic utterances of our sister. And now God, we turn to hear a word from you. I've studied, but I need your strength. Prepared, but I need your power. Willing and I want to, but only you can make me able. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my Lord, thy will to see, open mine eyes and illumine me, spirit divine, amen. Again, looking as we're walking through the seven churches, I'm asking you to look at the church of Pergamum found in Revelations 2, beginning with that 12th verse. I want to just reread a couple of those verses and it says, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast thy name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I'll come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. This is the word of the Lord. Help me put a tag on the text and just look at your neighbor and say, we do have standards. That's what I want to talk about. We do have standards. We do have standards. I'm prepared to struggle with you for about 10 minutes until we can get along. I want to talk about we do have standards. There is a very uh, iconic or epic scene 
in an iconic movie that most of us remember, love, and appreciate. The movie was called Lean On Me. And the scene is with Robert Guillaume and Morgan Freeman, Frank and Joe. And they are in a heated conversation because Joe's approach to being a principal is causing everyone a lot of consternation. He has a really good idea, but he's going about it in some interesting ways. So he's called into a courtroom where the police, the mayor, the parents association, they are mad at Joe Clark. And finally, Robert Guillaume has had enough because he is the superintendent of schools and it's getting on his nerves and he is catching everything. So he finally helps Joe Clark understand that he is wrong. He needs to apologize. And for a while, they're arguing back and forth. And then Robert Guillaume just goes in. He goes in, he says, you are going to apologize. You are going to step and fetch it. You are going to do as you are told. You are going to re-instruct. He just read him the riot act and he gave it to him. And he says, and in case you did not know, I am the HNIC. And the, and the discussion ended no more. And he walks out and he turns around and said, now, come on, let's go to eat. I mean, he gave it to him. And most of us, most of us who have friends, most of us who have significant relationships know of a period of time when it was tested by having to tell somebody the truth, tested by having to hold somebody accountable. I don't know what I got with you if all we got is when we agree. I don't know what I have with you is all we have is when I like what you're doing or you like what I'm doing. That scene is so powerful because at the end of the day, it represents accountability, love, grace, and a commitment to excellence. It's a relationship that's built in principles and with boundaries. Why? Because real friends hold each other accountable. Real communities have standards. I mean, Frank wants Joe to win. And Joe wants and needs to be supported. Boundaries, whether they are taboo or reward, are necessary for human development. Every first Sunday, you and I come in here and we make a commitment to each other. It's not only a commitment to God, it's a commitment to each other. I promise you that I'm going to act a certain way and you promise each other and we promise each other that we are going to represent the most high God in this community. In fact, the only real place that can lay claim to your lifestyle is your church. No other place has any business suggesting to you of, of how to do X, Y, or Z. But your faith community does because we claim to be in contact with God and in covenant with each other that we might challenge each other to be best. Because my goal for you and your goal for each other and your goal for me is that we win, that we do well. My life is better if your life is better. My life is better if you walk into your if walk into your season and are living your best life. But in order for us to be able to do that, sometimes we got to challenge each other. Sometimes we have to contend for the unity and contend for the faith. It's going to get quiet in here because we do have standards. This is a letter to the church at Pergamum, or some would call it Pergamos. Pergamum is a seat of academia in this Iberian Peninsula. It is known for its library. There were over 320 volumes of books. People came there with all sorts of ideologies and philosophies. And when Christ writes this letter to John, to the angel of the church at Pergamum, he says, I want to celebrate the fact that you are holding my name, that in the midst of all of these ideologies and in the midst of all of this stuff, you are still holding fast to my name and holding fast to my name among those even in Satan's seat. I mean, you're in the belly of the beast and you're not ashamed of my name. 
People are being killed for my name, but you're still holding my name. I thank you for that, and I celebrate you. But I do have a little against you because you're sitting there in Satan's seat and it's beginning to seep in because you have those among you who are holding to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block in front of the children of Israel to eat meat offered to idols and to commit fornication. He says, listen, uh, and I need you to understand, I need you to clean it up. Or I am going to come and war against them with the sword of my mouth. But if you handle it, I don't start because we do have standards. You're wondering where I'm going. This text is a challenge to us to think about how we treat each other. It's a challenge to us to how we represent our faith and how you and I handle critique in our own lives, how we give critique to others, how we live in the balance of what our sister has told us about being judgmental, but how we call each of us to our best self because at the end of the day, we hear that great Negro spiritual saying, walk together, children. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. We do have standards. First thing that comes up is I think you need to remember and I need to remember that standards are important. Standards are important. What he celebrates in this moment, he says, I want to thank you and I, I celebrate the fact that you're holding my name even in Satan's seat that you are standing up for the faith. You have a standard. Now, the first point of this is, this is not a point of veracity. When I say that standards are important, I'm not arguing veracity, meaning my first point is not about whether it's true or untrue. My first point is not about whether your standard is right or wrong. It is about the psychosocial power and benefit of having borders and convictions in our lives. In other words, you need to believe something. And you need to have a reason for what you do. In fact, would you think about it this way? If I were to ask you, those of you that have a little going on today in your adult life, that things are going pretty well, when you think back in your life to those who had anything to do with your upbringing, who are the people that you remember and appreciate? I submit to you, it's not the permissive people in your background. It's not the people that let you get away with everything. I suggest to you that when I just said, who do you remember and appreciate? It's the people that held your feet to the fire. It's the people that didn't take any tea for the fever with you. It's the people that got with you. That is the reason that you are here. Is there anybody that play, blesses God for a grandmother that didn't play, for a grandfather that didn't play, for one of those old church mothers or your old church deacons that almost get on your nerves, but you are here today because they had standards. The one who held our feet to the fire. You know, it was interesting. I, had, I just had a, a recent conversation with a young couple who was getting married. Uh, and I, I bless God for the opportunity because I don't have these conversations much anymore. The, they go through premarital counseling. I'm not in it. But I had a chance to talk with a young couple about the pieces of their wedding. We do traditional weddings. And if you're going to change something in the wedding, at least have a reason for why you changed it. Because your, it's your wedding, but your wedding is our worship. And a wedding is a pre-enactment of what we believe to be the rapture. And I know you're young and I know you want to do all this creative stuff, but there's a reason that the bride comes down the aisle. There's a reason that the groom comes out first. There's a reason that you have bridesmaids. There's a reason that you're dressed the way you are. You're a reminder of the church and the groom is a reminder of the Christ. There's a reason we make vows. You're not writing your own stuff here. No, I'm, I'm, we, we making promises. We're not talking about what you felt like the first time you saw them walking in the room. We're talking about what you promised.
it's not what you promise to feel, what you promise to do. And so now you can change some stuff, but at least have a reason. If, if you understand why you walk down the aisle, nobody goes the other way. Nobody walks back the other way. And, and the reality is at least have a reason for what you're doing. You're wondering where I'm going because we're living in a day and age where it could be argued that we are so open minded that our lives are too porous to hold a conviction. The, what is being celebrated in this moment is that at least the people in Pergamum are holding on to Christ. The reason that it is important that we have some sort of principles is that in times of chaos and fear, rules, guidelines, norms, and standards become important to a community because a self is more attractive than a non-self. Surety is more attractive and compelling than unsure. Answers are more compelling than questions. Get in trouble, Waller. In many cases, Islam and Trump in their respective communities are offering simple answers to complex questions. And the reality is we in the church have made Christianity so hard to understand and that we get away because we're trying to get away from what the Bible really says because we don't want to struggle with what it says. And we have made it so difficult that most of us need to have a couple of degrees to discuss the Christian faith. And people are wondering, well, what does the Bible really say? And what does it really mean? And how do I live it? And here we are trying to have complex ideology and theology when people are asking the more simple questions of what does it mean day to day to live for God. You haven't caught me yet. Jesus says, listen, I'm going to break this thing down for you. There were 613 laws in the Old Testament, but I give you three to sum up the whole thing. You can get involved with the Torah and the Midrash and all the Talmud, but all 613 boil down to this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, body, and your soul. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you can focus in on these three, that means more than trying to go after all 613 of those sometimes we get so deep in the church that we forget that at the end of the day this thing boils down to how you love your neighbor how you treat the other person how you live how you live a principled life you wonder where I'm going Fewer non-negotiable rules and standards will fare better than having a bunch of nebulous, hard-to-grasp principles uh, that you live by. In other words, if you got a few rules that come out of the Word of God that you hold on to strongly, it's better than having a whole bunch of teachings that you waffle on or that it takes a PhD to understand. Because at the end of the day, God is looking at how you treat your neighbor. God is looking at how you love God. I mean, at the end of the day, does anybody in here understand that when you get up in the morning, you ought to start by calling his name. When you get up in the morning, you ought to spend a little time, have a little talk with Jesus. Before you leave your house, make sure your house is intact. Make sure you practice love in the house before you get outside of the house. You can't be a star down the street. You can't be a star everywhere else and not a star in your own house. Am I talking to anybody else in here? Standards are important, but get in trouble, Waller. Your thoughts and feelings are not authoritative. Notice what he says. He says, I know that you're sitting in Satan's seat and you're dealing with satanic influence. And the satanic influence is being seen in your life because you have those in your midst who are holding to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block in front of the children of Israel. Can I dig in? Why did he call it Satan's seat? What does it mean for Pergamum to be Satan's seat? Satan's seat because Pergamum was a place of academicia. Satan, it was a place of the mind and we need to know that Satan does his battle in the area of the mind. Let me see if I can make a plain. Touch your neighbor, say we're going deep and then we're coming up. He says you're in Satan's seat. How does Satan operate? 
He, it is expressed in Genesis 3 and it is explained in 1 John 2 and 16. Whatever you believe about the Genesis account, it teaches us the principles upon which how Satan deals with us. Do you remember over in Genesis 3, Satan comes to Eve and casts doubt on God's word. He said, did God really say that you're going to die if you eat this fruit? Casting doubt on his word. After he cast doubt on his word, Eve says, well, he told us that we should not eat it and we should not touch it. What Eve said was not true. Eve didn't have it completely right. Satan takes advantage of the fact. He casts doubt between Eve and the word and then takes advantage of the fact that Eve didn't have it right. And this is not casting aspersion on any sister in here, but Eve didn't have it right. And then Satan then points to the three things that Satan always points to out in the first John 2 and 16 for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of life. He pointed out that the fruit was good to look at. It was good to eat and it was desirable because if you eat the fruit, you won't need God. You will know what God knows. Let me try it again. Satan casts doubt on the word of God. He says, if you eat this fruit, you won't really need God and you can know what God knows. And then he says, look, it's good to eat and it's good Good to look at. You're missing it. What Satan does and the way Satan tries to operate is to get you to doubt his word and then get you to be in your feelings and in your truth. If Satan can get you out of the word of God and get you in your feelings and then get you in your truth, then he has won and you are now sitting in Satan's seat. I'm going to try it until you get it. And isn't that the mantra of where we live today? I'm in my feelings and I'm in my truth. And yet what we know is that the goal of my life is not to live my truth. The goal of my life is to live in the truth. But the problem is if I'm living my truth, my truth might not be the truth. And in my feelings, I need to be reminded that I trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding and in all my ways acknowledge him and he will direct my path get in trouble Waller he says in the text that what happens the goal of Satan is for us to get involved in other ideologies and other things that appeal to my eyes and appeal to my ambitions did you notice what he says about Balaam and Balak and fornication while most of us understand fornication to have sexual implications and it does in this context the fornication has to do with picking and choosing from all types of ideologies and theologies yes sexual fornication but also picking and choosing the things we like in the world and avoiding the things that are uncomfortable and there are a whole lot of us that just want to feel good that just want to make sense to us that just want to have what what we want to have so I'll take a little bit of this and I'll take a little bit of that I'll take a little bit of this um, this religion and take a little bit of that religion I'll take this part that feels good but I don't want anything that tells me I'm no good I don't want anything that tells me to do better I don't want anything that challenges me he says and you've gotten into the ways of the world and you're not growing and you are buying in to the worldly understandings of sex and sexuality you are buying into worldly understandings of, of having and growing and being but you're not in the word of God. The Satan's goal is to get you in your feelings and get you in your truth and then if you're comfortable in your truth and your feelings and can't nobody tell you anything then you are stuck where you are and you will never grow. But here it comes. That's where Robert Guillaume and Morgan Freeman help me again because all of us at times are going to need somebody who are willing to risk the relationship in order to get you to your next level. Uh, let me see. Touch your neighbor and say he's going to make you mad. 
Is there anybody in here that is grateful for, th for the people that are not afraid of you and that love you enough to press you so you can get to your next level? I don't need somebody that's afraid of me. I need somebody that can speak to me. In fact, I don't respect somebody that cannot say the truth to me. I don't want somebody walking around passive aggressive and letting me die and letting me not be my best. I want somebody to get with me and challenge me. In fact, if I'm going to be your friend, I'm going to have to tell you what you need to hear because my goal is to make sure that you make it because if you make it, I'm going to make it. But if you you don't make it I'm not gonna make it am I talking to anybody in here watch this he says you he says you fix them or I'm coming to do it now when I first read that first time I preached this first time I was like cool well God you come and handle it I mean that makes sense you deal with them but the implication is that when God says, if I come and deal with it, I'm fighting with the sword of my mouth. And you need to understand what that means. If I'm taking them out and you're co-signing them, you are going with them. Can I stop right here? I wonder what you would say to your friend if you understood that the reason that one of the doors in your life is not opening up because you are co-signing some foolishness in your friend's life and because you're not doing it but you're in the doctrine of it and God says I can't bless that and I can't bless anything connected to it and as long as you're connected to it and signing y'all gonna get mad at me this morning but somebody in here needs to recognize watch this in the movie, while it's a happy ending, you don't flex like that unless you are willing for them to not go to dinner. You can't flex on somebody calling them out if you're not willing that if they don't change, you're going on by yourself. Y'all gonna get mad at me. I love you too much to leave you where you are. I love you too much to let you go down like that. So I'm gonna say it like it needs to be said. And if you wanna come and go with me to my father's house, we can all go to the next level. Is there anybody in here that is grateful for the person who's standing Stepped into your life and called it like it is uh, so that you could get to where you are right now. I want to thank God for the friends that are not impressed with me. I want to thank God for the people who can see the anointing but can push past it and push me to my best. Am I talking to anybody in here? Because my thoughts, your thoughts, your feelings are not the authority. Now, would you notice what he said? He didn't talk about what they're doing. It's what they believe. He said, you have those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. This is a question of what you believe. It's not just a question of what you do. It is a question of what you subscribe to. It is a question of how you are building your life. And he says, it's not necessarily what you're doing, but it is what you are believing. And we cannot be just in our feelings and we cannot be just in our own way, but we must be in that that is of the word of God. And even when it's not comfortable, even when it hurts, even when it is a challenge, I know that the word of God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path and if I hold on to it God will take care of me let me see if I can come a little closer in other words so then what's right how do I know these standards if the standards are not what I think if the standards are not what I feel standards are important they don't come from my feelings and my thoughts but they come from the book that that says it comes from the word of God well, how do you know he's talking about the word of God, pastor? Notice the text. It opens up with he who has the sword, the two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Now, you know, this is the book of Revelation. So when you read the book of Revelation, you're reading imagery, you're reading allegory. This is not Jesus literally walking around with a sword out of his mouth. 
But what it is, is helping us to understand that over in Hebrews, the fourth chapter and the twelfth verse, that the word of God is like a two-edged sword and is sharper than any two-edged sword and it divides us between the soul and the spirit. And coming out of Jesus' mouth is a two-edged sword. Why? Because Jesus is the word and coming out of his mouth is the word and the, Jesus is the eternal logos and the word of God or the Bible is the written logos so that what is coming out of Jesus' mouth is the principles or are the principles that are found in the word of God and if you want to live life to its fullest then you want to find your authority in the word of God here it is if you're going to find your authority in the word of God then you recognize that the Bible is here for us to override our feelings and override our opinions and all of our feelings and opinions are to be tried by by the word of God so that when I read scripture all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction and for instruction in other words I don't read the Bible to figure out how to get more I don't read the Bible to have understand the universe and how it operates at a molecular level I don't read the Bible to have every detail of Jesus's life because the book of John says that Jesus did some things that are not in the Bible. I don't read the Bible to teach or explain all the complexities of science, but I read the Bible to understand God's moral absolutes for my life and the core things that I need to walk into what God has for me. When I say moral absolutes, the Democrats think I'm talking about the boardroom and the Republicans think I'm talking about the bedroom, but the moral absolutes that God has for us means that when we read and hear his word, he teaches us how to treat people, how to love yourself, how to take care of yourself, how to care for the elderly, how to walk honestly, how to handle fidelity, how to control your mouth, how and who you love, the theology of doing your best. Let me stop right there. Do you understand it's not really that deep, it's just this, God through his word will teach you how to show up as your best self every day. Do you understand that we have lost the understanding that one of the greatest things that I can do on any given day is have the best Alan Waller show up. And if the best Alan Waller shows up, then I'm going to honor God. Once a labor has begun, don't stop till it's done. Be the labor, great or small, do it well or not at all. You wonder where I'm going. You want to run around here speaking in tongues. Why don't you learn how to speak to people? You want to run around here jumping and shouting learn how to do an honest day's work you want to run around here and have church all day learn how to show up on time learn how to be the best at what you do learn how to help somebody else that's what God is looking for in our lives God is looking for us to use the word of God to show us how to build a life that reflects God that when somebody looks at your life they want to know what do you have and how can I get it am I talking to somebody do you understand that when you order your life by the word of God even in Satan's seat then somebody will look at you and say I want what she has I want what he has that wasn't enough let me see if I can make it plain God will put you in situations so that somebody can look at your situation and look at what is going on in your life and when you order your life according to the word of God then they have to deduce couldn't nobody but God do that I know who he is I know where he's from I know what he's been through but look at what God is doing in his life that's why when you excel and when God blesses you don't start bragging about what you did for yourself that's when you have to give God glory when you're on the job and when you make the sale and when you get the degree and when you get the promotion that's where praise goes right there that's when you let somebody know if it had not been for the Lord on my side I wouldn't be where I am wouldn't have what I have, wouldn't know what I know, but it's because of God. That wasn't enough. Let me see if I can make it plain. We do have standards. Now, that means if I build my life according to the word of God, 
then my life will reflect my best. See if I can make this thing plain. I'm out of here. Sister Walla helps me with this because she, back in the day, Sister Walla used to be an Ikea queen. I can't, not, not anymore, not anymore, but, but she used to be an Ikea queen. And that, you know what Ikea is. It's, it's some good stuff, but you got to build it. And you got to build all of it. I mean, and you got to build, I mean, you got to build the, the nails. You got, you got to build everything. And, and so, you know, and she didn't need me to help, but it was highly recommended that I be involved in it. So she'll buy, she'll buy the bookshelf or she'll buy the thing and she'll bring it home. And then I'm a dude, I know how to use, I know how to use tools. And so first way, there's only one way to do it right. But I had some ways that I could go about building the bookshelf. This helps me and I'm out of your way. Sometimes we get the Ikea at home and I open it up and I know it's a table. And I know what a table is. <laughs> table got four legs, got a top. And I open it up, I ain't reading them instructions. <laughs> ain't no picture on the box. I know what I think a table ought to be. So I just start working on it. Because I'm making it from my own thoughts. And I, I start putting it together and I, I, I could get some legs on it and I, I can get it kind of all right, but the table I built by myself, you really ain't want to sit at. The table I built by myself, you ain't want to put nothing on it because it might not hold up. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of us in here have built life based on what you think and based on what you feel and based on what you saw and based on the table that you had in your life. And you grew up with a three-legged table. And so all you know is a three-legged table because you based it in your own life. But then there's another way. There's another way. You get something from Ikea and you get the box and it did come in instructions. And, and so you get the box, but sometimes there's no picture on the box. And you do have the instructions, so I start trying to read the instructions. But the thing about Ikea, Ikea is not an American company. And the stuff in Ikea didn't come from America. And so sometimes the instructions were not originally written in English. And so you get the instructions, and they were written in Belgian or written in French, translated in English on about the fifth page. So now you read in English, and you don't have a picture to look at, but you are reading the instructions, but the instructions are so hard to understand that you're trying to build this thing. You don't have a model of what it looks like and you're reading the instructions and you're getting it, but it's not working out because the instructions are so difficult to understand because they were originally written in another language and now you're trying to figure them out, but you don't understand who the author really is. And so now you're trying to put it together and the table just gets frustrating and then you leave it alone some of us have tried to do it with the bible but you don't know who wrote the bible and you're just reading the bible but you ain't met the author of the bible and you don't really understand what the bible says and you're coming up with foolishness trying to put your life together and here comes another two-legged table because you gave up on it and did not know what you're doing but then there's another way that worked really best the best way is when we bought something from ikea and there was a picture on the box it, it said this is what it's supposed to look like but not only that sister Waller and I would build it together now the way we built it together is her gift she's a teacher she's a teacher and I am an auditory learner it really doesn't do for me to read the instructions I need to hear the instructions so what would happen is sister Waller would get the instructions and she would read the instructions as she read the instructions I would listen to her faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I listened to it and then as she read the instructions, I would do what the instructions say. Sometimes she would have to say, it takes a screwdriver and I'd grab a screwdriver. She said, no, a Phillips screwdriver and she'd have to correct me because I picked up the flathead. She said, no, it's a Phillips screwdriver.
driver and I didn't like how she said it to me but I'm the one but she was right and so I pick up the Phillips screwdriver and then when she read it to me and when I'm trying to fix it and then I'm like I don't understand what you're saying she said tab B goes into slot A tab B cannot go into tab C tab B goes into slot A y'all just heard me and then I would be looking and then when I got frustrated with what she was saying I just look at the picture on the box and between the picture on the box and her reading the instructions and my doing my gift the next thing I know I got the table y'all wondering where I'm going when God builds your life if you will listen to the instructions and if you will look at the picture and his name is Jesus when you get frustrated with the Bible just look at Jesus when the instructions are not understandable just look at Jesus when you're not sure what to do just look to the author and finisher of our faith and if you will do what he told you to do eyes have not seen and ears have not heard neither has it entered into the hearts of them what God has in store for them that loves him come on let's ride I stopped by to tell you that we do have a standard and the standard is the word of God sometimes the word of God will cut you sometimes the word of God will make you mad sometimes the word of God will push you but the word of God will call you up to your best self and as a matter of fact sometimes God will put people in your life who don't just tell you nice stuff but they'll tell you what you need to hear thank God for the truth tellers thank God for the people who believe in your best who believe in your next as a matter of fact why don't you help me close this out and look at your neighbor and look at your neighbor say neighbor I'm not here to gas you up I'm not here to just give you flattery but I'm here to let you know that God has a purpose for your life and if you hold on to God's unchanging hand if you follow the word if you follow his word God will take care of you God will pick you up and turn you around in the all right I don't know about you but I'm gonna hold on to his word I'm gonna read his word I'm gonna worship in his word and I'm gonna believe that the best is yet to come I may not be all I ought to be and I may not be all I'm gonna be but I thank God I'm not what I used to be because God has been pushing me God has been calling me God put people in my life that challenge me in the all right say yes I'm trying to leave y'all alone but I believe the best is yet to come I want to thank God for another chance I want to thank God for taking me and loving me is there anybody here that knows that God is about to open new doors in your life is there anybody here that is ready to walk in to your new season well I dare you grab a hold of the Word of God let it be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path say yes 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 look at your other neighbor say we have standards we have standards I'm trying to leave y'all alone I'm not letting you go out like that I'm not letting you not be your best I want you to believe God for your best I want you to believe that you are the head and not the tail you are above and not beneath I want you
you to believe that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Yes! Yes! Listen, I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but I know there's somebody in here who says, you know what, Pastor, you are calling me right now. It's time for me to come on home. It's time for me to walk into my next season. It's time for me to give my life back to Christ. It's time for me to come on back into the church. I've been sitting in Satan's seat. I've been going to my own truth. I've been in my own feelings, but not in the word of God. I'm not trying to embarrass you. But I've got it on good authority. God said, today is the day you start over. Today is the day you start your new season. Today is the day you start walking in what God has for you. And when you start walking, you're not the only one in here, I promise you. Somebody needs you to start walking first and there are persons who are coming after you. If you know it's time for you to come on out from where you've been and start walking in the new thing that God has for you, come on down. The doors of the church are open. My brother, my sister, why don't you come? My brother, my sister, why don't you come? Come on, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yep, I see you. Come on, come on. that every need be you are come on come on pour it to me come on family come on i need you to survive come on come on come on come on i need come on i pray for you you pray I love you. I need you. I won't harm you with words. I love you. I pray. You pray. I love you. I need you to. I won't harm you. Say that again. I pray. You pray. I love you. I need. I won't harm you. With words from my mouth. I need. It is his will. It is his will. Every need. Come on, 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 come on. Where is that person? We're getting ready to get out of here. But there's somebody in here that's wrestling with this commitment right now. You're not a new Christian. You know you love God. You have a relationship with God. You're out of the church. You're in church every Sunday morning, but you have not made a church home because of past hurt. But you know that the block in your life is that you have not connected back with the church yet and are walking in your calling. You're in here this morning. I'm not afraid to look foolish by asking you to come on now. It's time for you to come. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes, come on, 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 come on. Yep, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. I pray. You pray. I love you. Come on, I need I won't harm you with words. I love you.
that every God's still moving. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. I need you to. Come on, would you bless God with me for this response to the word? Amen. 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 Those of you that are before us today, if you're here for the very first time and have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, we're going to pray a prayer with you that asks Christ into your life. If you've already accepted him, but you're coming back home, you don't need to pray this prayer with us. We're going to pray a prayer of rededication. Then the person next to you is going to take you into the rear to minister to you more fully. We bless God for you. We believe that God knew from the foundation of the earth that you would be here today for this moment in your life. And that God is doing a new and very special thing in your life. Because we do have a standard and there's a standard for you. We're bowing our heads. Those that feel led, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I admit that I was a sinner. But I accept your son Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and rose again with all power in his hands. Thank you for saving my soul in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for these that have come and I thank you for the word that challenges us to think about where we are and where we're going. I thank you for those who are answering the call and who are going to walk into their new season. Lord, help us to love on each other and press each other that we might walk into the new thing that you have for us that we might be our best self in this season, that ultimately you would get glory and it'll be for our good. We pray these and all of the blessings in the matchless, marvelous, and majestic name of Jesus the Christ. And for his sake we do pray that every heart say amen, amen, and amen. Would you bless God for these that have come? I'm going to ask that you would go to my right or to my left as we're going out. The persons that are with you are going to minister to you more fully. Listen, saints of God, I am looking forward to seeing you in Bible study. It will be online on Tuesday night. All day Thursday is an important conversation about our justice system. And on Thursday night, we will be together to hear from the AGs. I look forward to seeing you brothers on Saturday. Let's get ready to go out of here and let's bless God. Make sure that you greet somebody before you get out of here. I'm going to ask God's blessings and God's benedictions on us at this point. God, I love you and bless you and I thank you. I thank you for your word that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths. Lord, help us to walk in it and stand by it that in our lives you would get glory and it would be for our good. Now, God, as we leave this place, but never from your saving grace, Lord, give us traveling grace until we meet again. We ask it in the matchless, marvelous, and majestic name of Jesus the Christ. And for his sake, we do pray that every heart say amen, amen, and amen, amen, amen.